that for you? I do not see any comments at this time, and I do not have any hands raised. Okay, uh, we'll move on then to commission comments. Do uh, uh, any of the commissioners have comments on items not on the agenda? Okay. 
Hearing none, uh, we'll move on to staff comments. Staff? Um, I did want to bring up to date on that, um, just a brief intro about the Kaiser project. You had asked for an update of whether or not they were going to study the 40th Avenue um, throughput. And they looked at it in their preliminary uh, CEQA, but they've decided that it's not going to be one of the options that is looked at within the project. Um, so it's not ready to go to hearing yet, and I'll make sure the Planning Commission is aware once that is going to hearing. Okay. They, they expect it to be a, at least a few months out when I inquire. Um, and that's questions? it for comments. Okay. Uh, I have no questions on that issue. Uh, any, uh, and any other questions of staff? If not, we'll move on to item 4A, uh, 4A, which is approval of the December 2nd, 2021 regular planning commission meeting minutes. Move approval. I'll I second hear, it. I hear a motion for approval by Commissioner Ruth and a second by Commissioner Westman. Uh, Louie, could we have a roll call vote? Yes, please. Commissioner Chris Benson. Commissioner Chris Benson. Aye. Commissioner Newman. Aye. Commissioner Ruth. Aye. Commissioner Westman. Aye. Chair Will. Just, just a, Aye. a point of order. I think Commissioner Christensen should have abstained because she was absent at that meeting. I was for the two for October seventh and October fourth. I was. I was uh, this, is for, this is for December 2nd. Oh, oh I'm, yep, so, sorry. I'm sorry. I, I thought it was for the last meeting. Yes, I'll abstain from the last meeting. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, very good. Let's move on then to the consent calendar. I see no items on the consent calendar. Is that true, Katie? Correct. Okay, then we'll move right on to public hearings. Public hearings are intended to provide an opportunity for the public to discuss each item and uh, will be the procedure, procedure will be as follows the staff presentation planning commission questions followed by public comment planning commission del deliberation and finally a decision uh, first item on public hearings is item 6a 1820 41st street suite a yes good evening commissioners and and thank you um, just real briefly on this item uh, 1820 41st Street, this conditional use permit amendment. We had a late uh, request for continuance from the applicant. Uh, they're requesting continuance to April 7th. A uh, reason given was they wanted some more time to think about the recommended conditions and they also had a scheduling conflict. So there is no formal uh, presentation from staff or the applicant this evening. Uh, but as a matter of procedure, we did notice this item. And so we do need to take uh, any public testimony during um, when we open the, the hearing. So that's all I have for, for this item and the update. Very good. Well, if we're going to follow Robert's rule, rules of orders, then we'll ask up if there are any planning commission questions of said continuance. Nope. If not, we'll move on to public comment. Does anybody wish to comment on uh, 1820 41st Avenue? Any hands raised or emails? And I'm going to look to Sean again. We don't have anything new at this time. Okay, then we'll turn it over to the Planning Commission. Does anybody wish to discuss this or make a motion? I'll make a motion to continue this item to April 7th. I hear a motion from Commissioner Westman. Do I hear a second? I'll, sec I'll second. Um, and I hear a second from Commissioner Christensen. A motion and a second. Uh, any further deliberation? Not, uh, Louis, could we have a roll call vote for a continuance? Yes, please. Commissioner Christensen. Aye. Commissioner Newman. Aye. Commissioner Ruth. Aye. Commissioner Westman. Aye. Chair Will. Aye. Uh, motion passes. Um, 
Let's move on to item 6B, which is a citywide ordinance applicable to single family zone ordinance 1049. Uh, do we have a presentation? Yes, good evening, commissioners. Um, I just wanna begin by, uh, again, uh, Layla's with us this evening from Burke, um, our, our attorney's office. And Layla's put in a lot of work on this ordinance. So it's just been uh, great working with her and um, any questions that come up tonight, the two of us will tag team and work through any questions you have. Um, and also want to just say that uh, Brian and Sean have been very instrumental in brainstorming this ordinance. And it's, we're hoping with all these brainstorms that are going on in the office, it's going to improve by the next time you see it. So, um, so I'll jump into it. Our SB9 ordinance. A background on this is on September 1st, 2021, the California legislature passed SB9. It was signed into law on the 16th, and then it became, it went into effect on January 1st, 2021. Um, the Coastal Commission uh, put out the memo that you all received today, and we had a meeting yesterday. And um, within, originally I thought that it would go into effect even within the coastal zone. And they clarified that because our existing LCP does not have any um, guidance for urban lot splits and two unit development, it will not come into effect in our coastal zone until we've created that ordinance and until it's been certified by the Coastal Commission. So right now, SB2, SB9 is effective outside of the coastal zone. Um, so in talking with the Coastal Commission, um, they, they were advising that we should consider how to propose lots in residential development might impact the public access, sensitive habitats, recreational areas, and other coastal resources. They also um, advised that the new LCP provisions um, that limit or prohibit subdivisions in vulnerable areas uh, subject to sea level rise and that appropriately account for coastal hazards and coastal resource impacts, including um, and associated with sea level rise for new residential development. So right now there there is some clauses within um, the ordinance about flood areas, um, but when we I think in our next revision we'll we'll work towards implementing the recommendations also of our coastal commission. And to date they have not had one certified. Um, so their memo. Also, as I had just explained, that you know our future LCP cannot be in conflict with the Coastal Act. The currently certified provisions of our LCP are not superseded by the new SB9 legislation. So, um, until we have an LCP amendment in place, and where there's any conflict um, between the two, um, they must be consistent with the new law. Those, the LCP provisions should be updated to be consistent with SB9 to the greatest extent feasible while still complying with the Coastal Act requirements. And I'm sure as you read through that, sea level rise is a real um, uh, focus of that memo that came out. So we'll be looking at what areas we have. Um, we have we have maps tied to sea level rise, and it's something that I think in the next round of this ordinance update. Um, modifications what we'll be bringing back to you okay um so overview well, of S yep excuse me could, could we uh, maybe interrupt your presentation because i think that's kind of like a separate issue that there might be questions sure. of just this commission portion i know i have a couple yes well, and i'm you know i'm just looking it looks i just want to see um okay I think that's fine. We have one attendee on our Zoom meeting, and I think this is more of like a work session item at the end. Um, I think my recommendation tonight is, is instead of adopt or a positive recommendation, we'll be asking for a continuance. So I think it's fine if we work through things as we go. We just have to remember to open the public hearing at the end. Okay, well, uh, so this is more of a question than a, than a discussion, um, but uh, it's, uh, so the, the notion of, of the sea level rise in areas, I guess, mostly the village, don't we already have new building requirements that someone was to tear down a building and put in a new one? And there's, there's things like you have to have garage on the bottom floor, that kind of thing. Yes. 
So w when we when we when you would do this, you would, you know, to what extent would would you like be bringing in environmentalists or engineers or whatever to to rewrite this, or would this be kind of like okay, well, we already have these requirements, we just need to adapt them to uh, this new fourplex or whatever. So. Um, in the Coastal Commission, they talk a lot about um, not intensifying uses where there's, you know, within areas that will probably be subject to sea level rise. The point being, um, if we know that they're not going to, that space won't be there for that long, why would we intensify the use there and make more of a problem? Um, they have those gu the guidance documents that were currently on sea level rise that has not been um, Adopt, adopted by the state at this point, so it's just a guidance document. But um, I, I don't think if I think if we submit an ordinance that allows urban subdivisions in an area where they'll be where is it within the sea level rise map that they'll be pushed back from the coastal commission. I, I don't think we can just engineer ourselves out of it. I think they don't want to see intensification of use in that area. So you're like you're, this likely this item is likely to be tabled for a while before it comes back to us, right? It it depends. I mean, if we write our ordinance so that it's uh, the SB nine is not um, these two unit developments are, and and lot splits are not allowed in areas subject to sea level rise, then they won't have concerns. If we're inclu including those areas, then I. I think we'll get pushback from the Coastal Commission. All right. Any other questions on, on the Coastal Commission item um, before we push on? <laughs> yeah. I think you have three hands raised. Uh, I, I, my screen doesn't have, doesn't show, it just shows this. Maybe oh. if I hit, no, <laughs> I don't have a gallery view button. So I have one hand that I see raised, which is Ed Newman. Well, I so, citizens was raised first. Okay, well, I, uh, sadly, my screen doesn't show her, but okay, go ahead, Susan. And and I'll actually defer to the attorney if she wants to go first, if she wants to clarify this. I just wanted to say, so there's no confusion, I think the current regulations about having uh, buildings above the garage and that are flood regulations that are in response to FEMA requirements. They don't have anything to do with what the Coastal Commission has asked us to do or seems to be planning on asking communities to do based on their, um, I forget what he called it, uh, their letter that they put out that hasn't been adopted yet. So they haven't really adopted any regulations the way I understand it. We're working under FEMA. That's Thank all you. I had to say. Thank you. That was very informative, Susan, uh, or Commissioner Weston. Uh, other hands raised. Again, uh, if you could speak up, because I don't have a screen that shows anybody but Susan right now. Well, the city attorney and Mr. Commissioner Newman. Uh, Commissioner Newman, would you like to go ahead and raise your hand or go ahead and speak? Yeah. That's got to be a way I can. <laughs> I'm going to work on my screen in the meantime. Yeah. Maybe if I go ahead of time, the uh, city attorney can maybe respond to my uh, confusion, which is I'm trying to put together what I am hearing and what I have read in terms of where we are in the interim period here while the uh, staff uh, works on dating the LCP to try to, to harmonize these uh, these two laws. So if I understand, what I'm understanding is that outside the coastal zone, the SB9 housing uh, provisions to facilitate housing are fully in effect. Inside the coastal zone, the way I read some things are that the SB9 requirements are in effect as long as you take into account the requirements of the Coastal Act. Uh, but then I'm also hearing that they're not in effect at all in the coastal zone. So maybe I could get some clarification on that. Okay, uh, staff, can you chime in? Yeah, I, I can uh, I can kind of jump in at this point. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce myself 
as well. Uh, my name is Layla, Layla Moshraf Dinesh with Burke Williams and Sorensen, um, and I work with Sam Zettler, the city attorney, on a regular basis and have been working with Katie and staff on the SB9 ordinance. Um, these are great questions, and particularly looking at what the Coastal Commission has recently stated, um, it's interesting because there seems to be a bit of a tension, right, between the the statute of SB9 as, and versus kind of this memo that we've received recently from the Coastal Commission. Um, and, uh, you know, I think what we definitely want to make sure we're doing is ensuring that the city is not caught in the middle between these kind of two uh, entities, right? So the best way I would say, it's definitely a challenge to at this point be consistent with both um, SB9 as well as what the Coastal Commission is saying in its memo. And I think that the best way to approach it for now would probably be to see if we can read or harmonize the two together, looking at our LCP at this point and seeing if there's a way to um, kind of incorporate some of the SB9 um, development using our current LCP. Um, and that's just from, you know, some research that we I did the last few days is to ensure that we're still applying with SB complying with SB9, but we're doing it in the spirit of also being consistent as much as possible with the Coastal Commission. But I think um, what Katie mentioned is, is crucial in that ultimately we do need to update our LCP so that we are more in line with, um, you know, so we can kind of overcome that inconsistency. To me, does that answer your question, uh, Commissioner Newman? You're on mute. Uh, that makes sense to me. I think we need to um, not just completely ignore SB9 inside the coastal zone the way I read it, but to try to, uh, to um, implement it to the extent we can without uh, violating the Coastal Act and our LCP. Yeah, I think that would probably, if that's possible, that would probably be the best approach. Um, again, Katie's absolutely right. According to the to the Coastal Commission, um, you know, they're saying SB9 doesn't apply, but I think we just have to, you know, look also at SB9 itself, which doesn't uh, kind of come to that same conclusion. So that's kind of what makes it a little bit uncomfortable <laughs> for lack of a better term. <laughs> well, if the, the, if the Coast Commission doesn't want increased risk due to density, I would think that's the, that's the stumbling block right off the bat unless we start putting pilings down to bedrock. But I'll let the lawyers worry about that. Uh, any more questions on um, this section on the Coastal Commission specifically? If not, We'll move ahead with the rest of the presentation and uh, go ahead, Katie. Okay, thank you. Um, so SB9, the intent was to increase our housing stock and to do so it was by increasing residential densities within the single family neighborhoods. Um, all eligible properties within a single family zone may be split into two lots with two residential units on each lot. So, I, this is our zoning map, and I'm highlighting all of the R1 areas within the city of Capitola, just to kind of get a feel of what, what could be the impact of, uh, where will we see this densification happening? Um, Brian went through and looked at all of the neighborhoods and just a bird's eye view um, using aerial imagery to see how many lots are currently developed in such a way that they have a lot of open space and could take it could utilize SB9 without having to tear down their home and likely could build at least a second unit, if not a duplex, maybe in the backyard or an area of open space. 
And looking at the different neighborhoods, these numbers represent the lots that we saw potential for SB9 without doing a total um, demolition of the properties. So, um, and then once uh, we got the update from the Coastal Commission, I just want to point out that there's the coastal boundary in purple. And so this area you're seeing over in the uh, top left-hand corner is really the area that currently uh, applications can come in and be reviewed or be reviewed uh, prior to this adoption. And it will take effect once we've adopted uh, the, the ordinance and then the area within the coastal zone once it's certified by the Coastal Commission. So um, it, it'll give us some, a, a trial run while we're getting going through the certification process with the coastal zone to see what occurs in this in our uh, in, in that corner of Capitola. So the SB9 ordinance tonight you're going to see four different sections of code. We added section 16.08 for a definition of urban lot split. We added a section 16.08020 for the urban lot split. Sorry, I've got the number wrong for the definition. Um, a subsection for applicability within our ADU section of code. And then we added a chapter 17.75 that describes uh, the applicability of procedures and standards for two unit development. So that's a new chapter. And it follows right after our ADU chapter. So urban lot splits. And at any time, go ahead and raise your hand. I can see the hands on my end. If you have questions, I'll stop. Uh, urban lot split is the one-time subdivision of an existing single-family residential parcel into two parcels. Um, each property is allowed up to four units total with two units on each parcel. And I see um, Chair Wilk has a hand up. I do. Let's see if I can now lower it. <laughs> lower it. Okay. So my question is, so you're creating this ordinance update. What happens to applications that come in before it's adopted? Before it's adopted, we follow the standards of the law and we can apply only the objective standards within our code. So that being height, setbacks, floor area, floor area ratio um, of our existing code. So in the R1, they would get a height of 25 feet. Um, the setbacks would be they would follow the setbacks of the state law for four foot on the side and okay but uh, so you don't need to repeat that repeat yeah. all those but my question would be like for example one of the things we have in, in your proposed update would be you have to have room for a driveway right and so I don't know is that so are there things in there that would indicate that well if we want to have more control over this in terms of driving driveway parking utilities you have it we it's, it's uh it's in our best interest to get something on the books quickly rather than dragging our feet. Definitely, yeah. So we want to be able to guide it. Right now, we don't have much guidance on how development should happen until we've adopted something. So they would they would have the ability to develop, and they'd be required one parking space per unit. In your and, uh, SB nine. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, uh, SB nine also includes um, several permissive sections which allow the city to decide if they want to require something or not. And so in order to, you know, take take that opportunity, we certainly, you know, want to adopt something or we recommend that, you know, we would adopt something in order to be able to kind of hone in on the specifics of how to comply with state law. Commissioner Newman has a hand up. Uh, I'll yield to Commissioner Ruth since he hasn't had a chance yet. Then I'll go. Thank you, Mr. Newman. Just just a, a point here. Looking at the diagram, I'm guessing the way it's configured, there's probably 90% of the lots in Capitola could not meet that configuration. I know it's not to scale, but I think it's a little deceiving because it, it just doesn't represent reality of the size of Capitola lots and what we're seeing on the screen. That's my comment. That's a great point. And we have a slide, actually we'll go through an example of that later in the presentation. Well, my, my question was, are these urban lot splits done by a, a typical parcel map and the, the same process? And so you have two 
two separate lots with assessor's parcel numbers that can be separately alienated? That's correct. Yep, so they can be sold separately after the um, subdivisions recorded. Okay, right, I'll move on. Um, so there's a list of eligibility that um, was some um, that, that's related to state law. And I want to um, preface this presentation by saying we took a really conservative approach. The, council, the planning commission can always loosen the standards. We just took a really conservative approach to the standards that you'll see in here. So um, again, no more than two, two lots will be created. Each lot has to have a minimum of at least 1,200 square feet, and each lot has to have at least 40% of the lot area of the original parcel, um, and it has to have access to or adjoins the public right-of-way, sufficient with fire codes. The second item has to have at least 40% of the lot area will be probably the hardest um, requirement for most developed lots to meet, because most homes in Capitola are situated in the middle of the lot. Uh, I've got a question from Commissioner Newman. He just never took oh. his hand down. Oh, okay, okay. Um, also eligibility standards that must be in the single family zoning district. The density limitation is not a reason to deny an application. The state has a list of qualified sites in which they cannot be located. They're tied to specific definitions for farmland, wetlands, fire hazards, hazardous waste, um, fault zones, floods. I won't read them all to you. They, they're not subject to income um, restrictions. So if there's an income restriction on a property, if there's rent control, if it's been subject to the Ellis Act, or if it's been rented in the past three years, it's, the property is not eligible. Um, it also cannot be part of a prior urban lot split, so you can't do this twice to your property. And then um, the, the map itself must comply with the Subdivision Map Act. And it looks like I have a question from Commissioner Ruth. Yeah. Is, is the 1,280 square foot requirement, uh, is that spelled out in SB 9? It is. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So objectives standards that we've put into this chapter. Um, parcels, this was actually taken, they were taken from our um, regular subdivision standards. So parcel lines at right angles to the street, there, this is new, minimum frontage of 20 feet um, or minimum of 20 feet for a flag lot or maximum of 40% of the lot width or 20 feet, whichever is less. We came up with a 20 feet minimum because um, our smaller lots are about 40 feet wide in Capitola. So we thought that um, the minimum frontage of 20 feet would be realistic in Capitola and then the 10 feet for a flag lot. I'll note for that standard, their um, minimum, at the end of my presentation tonight, I'm gonna to talk to you about whether these should be maximums. Um, so also the other objective standards are one parking space per lot there's exceptions based on the proximity to transit and car share. We don't meet the exception for transit. We don't have, uh, our metro doesn't run every 15 minutes um, through the city. There's no lines that run every 15 minutes. So that, that's the qualifying qualifier for uh, the type of transit listed in the state law. And then no setbacks for existing or reconstructed structures. And the lot split shall not result in the splitting of any structure between two lots and cannot create a new encroachment. And Commissioner Newman. So these are um, standards that are applied administratively, right? There's administratively, no. Administratively, yeah. So if, uh, for example, number one, if someone, for one reason or another, the, the parcel line is not at right angles, but it's at 85 degrees. and. Uh, can they come to the Planning Commission to uh, loosen that standard? They cannot. We, we didn't set this up in our ADU ordinance. We have it that way that if they don't comply with all of the um, regulations, they can go to the uh, Planning Commission. But no, at that point, um, the only way that they, we, we could modify that or make a be more flexible for them is if they can prove to us that they wouldn't be able to achieve two lots on that property and each 
uh, and not re not be able to build two 800 square foot units if they were if if uh, the right angles was prohibiting them from doing that. So, uh, Commissioner Ruth. Uh, how is the residency requirement monitored? Um, there is the way we've drafted the ordinance is that they would have to uh, sign an affidavit, I believe, that would be recorded. And is there any teeth in that? There is. I, I think it's similar to um, what we've done with ADUs in the past for residency that we can follow up and enforce. Okay, thank you. So just a quick image of what the 20 foot minimum looks like for a lot split and a 10 foot for a flag lot. Um, so the filing process, I'm sure you all read through this. I won't go through every step of this, but the biggest thing is that we've got to take action within 50 days. It's ministerially approved. There's no public hearing. It's a staff decision. And then it's really hard to deny these if they comply. So um, it either doesn't, it, we can only deny it if it doesn't uh, follow all the standards or if there's a finding of adverse impacts on public health and safety or the environment. Um, so use and development requirements also for the urban lot splits. Um, that, I'm sorry, that's, all right, here we go. The vacation rental is prohibited within these developments. Um, residential use only, maximum of 800 square feet, two dwelling units per lot, and then that guaranteed allowance. So the objective standards apply to all urban lot splits except where such standards directly con conflict with the provisions of um, the FB9 and whether the applicant demonstrates that such uh, that implementing those standards would have the effect of physically precluding the construction of two units on either of the resulting parcels that would result in less than 800 square feet uh, residential units. So any questions with that? Um, Commissioner Westman? Um, so in looking at your example of the flag lot, uh, which was sort of my impression how a lot of these would happen uh, because there is going to be an existing residence there and they're going to try and add one in the back part of their property. The front house can't be more than 800 square feet as well as the back house 800 square feet? Correct. We've drafted it that way. There's a... Yeah. Okay, I just want to clarify, we can yeah. talk about all this later. Thank you. Yeah. So that, that's our, the standards we've put together for urban lot splits. And next I'm going to go into the two unit developments, but any questions? And, and just to clarify as well, uh, commissioners, there could actually be two 800 square foot uh, units in the back and two in the front, technically, under SB9. That are a max of 800 square feet. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, K Katie, I have a, a question um, real quick. Uh, this va vacation rental thing, I'm, I'm just trying to see if there's, uh, you know, how, how that would apply. If, if someone has a vacation home already, and they say, well, I'm going to split this, wouldn't it be great to have two vacation homes? I'm in the vacation uh, rental zone. You would you would split it, but then you, they would say, I'm sorry, but you have to live in one of these vacation homes, but you could rent the other one? You can rent it long-term more than 30 days. You would not be able to rent it short-term anymore. So so even if even if the vac it's va in a vacation zone, it's beach house rentals, whatever, rents this place, and he decides to split it, he says, well, I'm going to split this lot, live in one half, and to continue to rent out the other half, the answer is no, you can't do that. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, Katie, I had one more question, <laughs> kind of related to Commissioner Wilt. Um, if, so now the two parcels are um, legally split, and they're now able to be sold, hypothetically. Um, if the the person that sells it, is there a deed restriction recorded per parcel that's then transferred to the new owner? 
that re re restricts all of these um, requirements? That's or is there something that, go ahead. That's a great question. I'm, I'm, uh, I need to re-look at the, uh, do you know the answer offhand, Layla? Do I believe that we may have included some type of a deed restriction. Um, and I know that, would, that, yeah, go ahead. I just was curious as how would the, the next owner or five owners down the way understand that this two, you know, 1200 square foot lot could no longer be used as a vacation rental or um, had all these different limitations. Yeah, that's a great point, Commissioner. Um, we will review the draft and see if we need to make some clarification on that. Um, to make sure that that this scenario would be covered. Okay. I, I know we require a deed restriction. I'm just not re remembering if it's part of the urban lot split, which it should be for that. You know, we should probably do it at the urban lot split. Um, and it's also tied to the two unit development. So we'll make sure of that. Any other questions? No? Okay. Move on. Um, so we added section 17.740M to our ADU um, chapter. And this is just stating that no accessory dwelling unit or junior ADU shall be permitted on any lot in a single family zoning district if, and one being an urban lot split has been approved herein, and two, a uh, two unit development with two units has approved for, uh, has been approved for construction pursuant to chapter 17.75. Other jurisdictions have been looser with this. Um, they're allowing the lot split, the two units through the two unit development, and then they'll also allow an ADU or a junior ADU. We've drafted the, um, because our lots are so small, we drafted our ordinance to not allow the ADU and junior ADU as, in addition to the two units. That's something you could direct us to change this evening. Um, and that's why some of the articles you see in the newspaper talk about four units per, um, property, some up to six, there's some flexibility in where you can go with this and how dense you want to make your single family. Commissioner Ruth? Yeah, so if you do a lot split, then the requirement is you must put two units on each lot or on the lot you've split off, you must put two units? It's up to two units. So if you only do one unit, isn't that the same thing as an ADU? ADU? It's, What's the uh, difference? The difference is that it can be sold as a separate lot. And the other difference is our ADUs, you can build up to 1,200 square feet. And within this ordinance under SB9, you can only build up to 800 square feet. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Newman? So as this is gonna come down, uh, property owners will be weighing whether or not to do uh, an ADU or uh, two units and look at the different uh, uh, requirements for each of those and see which one works best for them. Is that way you see this working out? I do. Um, the the ADU ordinance is almost more permissive and where you can uh, for parking requirements and parking. Whereas uh, the SB9, if your motivation is to sell off a piece of your property, then it's probably the way to go. Well, if you split it, but if you put two houses on it, and then there all there may also be big differences in terms of uh, utility fees and that sort of thing, depending sure. on which direction you go. And to be clear, um, it, the two units on the new parcel or the existing parcel cannot be sold separately. There. Okay. Um, so we just. Okay, so now we're, we're moving on, and we just went over the uh, general requirements for an AD, for the ADUs. Now into the new chapter 17.75 for two-unit development. Um, 
a lot of these standards you've already heard. So the first one is just um, that you can only have two residential units in total on each parcel, and um, they can either be two new units on a vacant lot or one new and one existing, and then any urban lot split has to comply with the standards we just went over. The eligibility requirements, we put them in both sections so it's really clear to an applicant. Um, they don't learn that they're ineligible once after they've gone through their lot split. So I'm not going to relist them here for you. The permitting process, again, it's an administrative review. The city has to take action this time within 60 days. Um, coastal development permit may be required, uh, not required noticing, but no public hearing. The reasons that I listed prior are the only reasons for denial. Um, and then once they have an approved application, it would go to the building permit stage. And we wouldn't allow it to go to the building permit stage until the urban lot split parcel map has been recorded. So the objective development standards, again, in this ordinance, uh, we're only as staff allowed to apply the new objective, the objective um, standards. So, the unit size, we did a maximum of 800 square feet. The state law says we have to allow at least 800 square feet. So tonight, after my presentation, I will be asking the Planning Commission if they want to increase that number or keep it the same. The setback set by state law is uh, the first story. It's the same as um, what your R1 district is at 15 feet. You have the ability to decrease that if you'd like. Um, we have a second story for the front yard of 20 feet and, oh, I'm sorry, that's a, yeah. And then for the garage, 20 feet, consistent with our R1 zone. The rear and side yard are, have a um, requirement to be at least four feet um, by state law, or it can be a maximum of four feet. The height, we, I incorporated the height standards from our ADU ordinance, so 16 feet for the first story, 22 feet for a second story. The story maximum, um, just in case there was a really large lot that it wouldn't be, the development wouldn't be forced into a second story. I set it as a single story. We can talk about changing that this evening as well. And then an open space requirement for each unit is 48 square feet. Any Wait, questions here? If, this, if there's only one story allowed, why do we have all these uh, objective standards for the second story? Um, because I think in many situations there, the lot sizes won't be large enough to accommodate an 800, two 800 square foot units within the first story. So we should have standards for a second story. It would make sense to increase that to two stories or. What does maximum one story mean then? That if the development can occur within one story, then it has to occur within one story, but only if um, oh. if they. Well, that's not very clear to uh, <laughs> to our consumer public. No, I think that we we should probably amend that because I don't think there's many examples in which yeah. you get two eight hundred square foot units without going to a second story. Yeah, Commissioner Ruth. Yeah, uh, you know, a, a large portion of the lots in Capitola, as you stated, are 40 by 80 lots. And the calculated footprint of a lot split on a 40 by 80 lot is 732 square feet, which would be allowed. So, but you're allowed an 800 square foot unit with a 732 square foot uh, footprint. So what happens is, we have to make some changes in the setbacks. Either the rear yard setback has to be decreased, the side yard or the front yard setback. So I'm not clear on why we're having all these requirements when they don't really apply to a 40 by 80 lot if you split it in half. So it's uh, a great point. And I'm gonna run through an example of a 40 by 80, but it, it reflects exactly what you just said. Um, with a 40 by 100 lot, which we have some of those in Capitola, um, these standards could be met. So I, I, tonight I will be suggesting that we um, create less stringent standards for the smaller lots. So we'll get into that in a, shortly. 
Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Um, so parking requirements, um, one parking space per unit is, is allowed um, with an exception for the transit or car share. Tandem spaces for separate residential units are not allowed. That's something we put in there, just um, thinking it would be pretty inconvenient. Uh, Planning Commission can direct us to do otherwise. Parking design, required off-street parking may be located within the minimum uh, required setback areas from front side and rear property lines. Um, Hollywood design with two parallel strips of pavement um, if, if a parking space were to put, be put in the front yard. Um, parking access from an alley shall maintain a 24-foot backout area, which may include the alley. So these standards also carried over from our ADU ordinance. Uh, separation between residential units, there's a minimum 10 feet from any other structure on the parcel. Uh, however, uh, the exception being units may be adjacent or connected if the structures meet building code safety standards and are sufficient to allow a separate conveyance. So this, this uh, separation between residential units, I do think also will confuse. Uh, this is one I'd like to be amended because it says there's a 10 foot minimum separation. However, as long as you build it to code, it doesn't apply. So um, by state law. So I think it's better for us to probably just remove that standard and just list number two that they must, you know, they have to meet building code. Um, and then exceptions to development standards, non-conforming structures, they can be um, rebuilt in the place that they were and there's no setback requirement for existing non-conforming. Any questions? And, no. Is um, the existing, do you think, can I, I have a quick question. <laughs> um, the existing non-conforming structures, is there a percentage that is, um, is, is it just kind of defer back to the percentage of demo that you can do to the structure to keep it within the existing non-conforming standards? You know, this is um, the, the state law. Mm -hmm. So any, it doesn't follow our 80% rule for non-conforming. It's any non-conforming structure can be rebuilt in its exact place gotcha. under within the section of code. Okay. Yeah, and it it deals kind of more with um, you know the setback requirement, for example. So say you have a structure that is not complying with Capitola's you know side or rear setback requirement, um, provided that the new structure. Uh, is built in exactly the same footprint as the old one, then uh, we would have to allow it. So you could completely destroy the, I mean, you completely take the house all the way down to the foundation and rebuild it within the same footprint and it would still be within the existing non-conforming um, structure. Yes, um, yes, okay. Unless, okay. Yeah, unless there was some other, you know, issue going on with it that wouldn't allow for demolition, like historic structure or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I see. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, and then we built in objective design standards. A lot of these were, oh, Commissioner Westman? So just, just so I understand how this works. Um, right now we have an ADU ordinance which basically allows anyone to build a second unit on their property up to 1,200 square feet if they meet certain requirements. And um, the main difference between that process and the result is that the ADU cannot be sold separately. And with SB9, the purpose is to create small units that end up being sold separately from the original parcel. And so when we get into creating parcels that are going to be have individual owners with an individual unit, then it seems like, you know, the setbacks do become a bit of an issue because I had sort of thought if you were going to have two 800 square foot units like on the back of a flag lot, 
those units probably should not have any separation. It should be more like a duplex. But then you get into issues of how is how are those individual duplexes think can those individual duplexes be sold separately or does it have to be sold as a duplex? So for two units on the same lot, anything on the same lot has to be sold um, together. So with uh, that example of the duplex on the flag lot, it would sell as a duplex there. They can't condo it and sell them separately. Okay. So, you know, I think we have to look at them in, because in that case, it would make sense to me to not have a setback between those two units because there's not going to be space um, mm -hmm. to do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, can I interrupt without raising my hand real quick? So, Susan, are you suggesting there be like townhomes with a common yeah. wall in between them? Uh, that's what I'm suggesting. I mean, if you're going to have two units on a parcel that small, um, I'm, I'm not really envisioning how you could design them and make it work. If you put, you know, per particularly a 10 foot setback between the two of them. And doing so um, would result in more meaningful open space. You know, there's a little bit of space mm -hmm. between the two units. You allow them to be uh, joined a shared wall. You you result result can be more open space. So that would should, that would reduce that 732 square foot print right. even more. <laughs> yeah. So we should definitely take out number one on your under your separation. Can I see a nod of heads for that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I I would love to take out number one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, so then the objective design standards, these are taken uh, from our ADU ordinance. And um, so the entrance orientation, primary entrance to face the front or interior, there's an exception for alleys and or side streets. Privacy impacts, um, the walls with windows within eight feet of a residential property line. First story, they should have a six foot solid fence on the property line. Clear story or opaque windows for all windows facing the adjacent property. And then on the second story, all windows facing an adjacent property shall be clear story or opaque. Um, and then decks and balconies are prohibited and um, covered porches and patios, there's 150 square foot max. And a third of that must be attached to the front of the dwelling unit. Materials and colors, I'd love to see back on this one. Um, the new and existing, if there's a, an existing home and a new, they must match the materials and color, except what if the existing material is uh, not permitted by building code. And then for two new units, um, the ordinance is drafted to say they much, must match material and color. So these are the units on the, sh sh two units on the same parcel. So should they relate, should they <laughs> match? <laughs> So if it, what you're saying is that if you have an existing house and a new house gets in the back that's going to be sold, they don't have to match. Thank but you. There's no way once you have two separate property owners to enforce them having to paint their house the same color. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought you meant on the same lot. No, if they're okay. on, on separate lots, they separate don't lots. have to match. No. You're just saying that the two units, like the townhouse development um, uh, on, the, on the individual lots have to match. Yes. So if there's an existing home and they build a new two unit development, a new unit behind them on the same property, it would have to match the existing home or if they created a new lot and built two new units, they need to match in, uh, material and color. But if I was going to build an ADU, I don't have to match the materials and color of the front house, do I? I cannot remember off the top of my head. I'm gonna, uh, I am don't know if Sean heard that question, but I'm, we're asking whether or not um, 
an ADU is required to match the primary home. I think it has to, I don't want to answer. I don't think so. I don't think so, because I've seen a few around town and they don't match the house at all. I, I can chime in here. Okay. Um, the standard for materials, uh, exterior materials are within the objective standards, which do not apply for our limited standards ADUs. Uh, that would include one of the more common scenarios of a, a, a detached ADU that's less than 800 square feet and complies with minimum setbacks. So the, a, a common scenario would not have to apply that. Okay, thank you. Um, I see Commissioner Ruth and Commissioner Newman. Yeah, yeah, Katie. Uh, I think when we talk about adding two units to a lot that has an existing house and the existing house remaining there, that doesn't apply in very many circumstances in Capitola. I think what we're going to see more likely is the small cottage type homes that you see in the Riverview Terrace and the Jewel Box. I see those houses being demolished and then the lot spits taking place. I don't think we're gonna have that other kind of scenario very often. Uh, the other question I have is the front porches and patios. Would those go into the front yard setback area or would they have to be confined outside that setback area? That, that's a great question. We should, um, we should uh, add to the ordinance with the allowed encroachments or projections into a setback. Cause that, if we want to allow it to um, be within the setback area, we should state that within our code. <laughs> Well, then that reduces, if you allow a 150 foot porch and has to be in the setback area, then that reduces the footprint on a 40 by 80 lot to roughly 580 feet. <laughs> yeah, is, is allowing a deck to project into a front yard acceptable by the planning commission? No. No. What? Can I ask why, um, Commissioner Ruth or Commissioner Wesson? Do your reasoning? Yeah, for me, the standard setback in, in most of our, all of our neighborhoods is 15 feet. Mm -hmm. So if you have a deck extending out beyond that, you're encroaching probably in parking areas and, you know, just basically encroaching into the neighborhood. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I guess I, I would agree with that as well. I don't agree with E at all, though. The materials and colors seems to be uh, getting too far into the weeds. That's where I was going. Also, I, I'm I agree. I'm impelled to, <laughs> to 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 restate what I've said many times, which is I don't think we should be the aesthetic stars. Uh, and the the best example of that is Venetian courts, which would of course never be built under E and has been one of the uh, uh, outstanding features of Capitola. Yeah, I can agree with modifying E and get rid of, getting rid of the uh, matching materials and colors. Why don't we say complementary? <laughs> they complement each other. Yeah, and, and who's gonna decide that? <laughs> Not a too much of an objective standard. <laughs> yeah, you could say that they they have to have um, like 25% of a shared material or something, or you could forget you know, it. Forget it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. You're trying to, you're trying to design something where you don't even have a template for. You probably won't see one of them from the street anyway, right? Well, <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So we'll take that out. Um, I did want to clarify, though, on the, the the covered porches. We do in the in the R1 district in our front yards. We allow uh, landing places, patios, and decks 18 inches or less from grade. To um, they can be in the front yard as long as that five feet are maintained. 
So that's a that's an allowance of a, uh, the front decks can go 10 feet into the front yard. Um, just to be clear, and we we do allow them in side yards, but they have to maintain three feet. Where our side yards are so small here, it wouldn't make sense. But so if if you wanted to allow a deck to go a certain distance into the front yard, it would be consistent with the R1 standards for right now. In a porch. Front porch. Yep. I would agree with that. I, I I'm kind of as long as there's. I think if designed properly, I feel like that would be, it would complement the street and, and allow parking, obviously, but not, but. Well, what about the, what about the prohibition on all decks and balconies? That's, uh, that's for a second, sorry, that's second story decks and balconies. So I should have, I typed that in incorrectly. And I assume the commissioners, based on our recent uh, attitudes, uh, would agree with that. Yes. 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 Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Westman? So um, I have a concern, and I don't know where really to bring this up. But by doing this, we're greatly increasing the amount of impervious surface that we have in town if these units get built. And for example, in the Riverview Terrace neighborhood, there is no storm drain system. So all of, all of that water simply runs down the street. And because so many people have been putting in more decks and land, you know, impervious surface, it's beginning to become a problem. So at, at what point do we look at, you know, the stormwater for all this new development for the um, providing the water for it? I mean, where, do, where does any of this come in? Because if you have a lot more units go in, you know, the neighborhood above me, you know, we already flood now, we have for about the last five years. Um, what, when does all of that come into play? I mean, usually in a subdivision, there's something that deals with stormwater and stormwater improvements and how those things get put into place. And actually, that's one of the uh, biggest uh, parts of a review of a subdivision now to be in compliance with the state law. It's really uh, it's challenging. We've seen a lot of applications come in that get held up on stormwater. So that is an excellent question, and it might mean that uh, Layla and I need to do more research. I'm not sure, Layla, if you're prepared for a question on whether or not we can, I, I believe we can require stormwater requirements, and that typically it's a, when you, it's part of our master application, and it's something we have not addressed in this ordinance. So we can come back with more information on that, okay. but, but it is an issue, and Currently, our, our normal process is stormwater is reviewed separately by public works, and there's a lot of um, review that goes into that to make sure it's in compliance. It um, seems like we might need to require a lot more uh, on-site uh, infiltration. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's got to be ways to do it, but we just need to make certain we have that done so we don't create a problem for our community. Yeah, and one option might be as well to, um, you know, potentially require that certain landscaping include um, low impact development as well as more pervious, uh, you know, soils and substrates and um, things like that. But we can definitely research that a little bit more, Commissioner, and get back get back to you because I think that is a really yeah, that is a very important point. Thank you. All right, continue. Okay, next are the general requirements for a two-unit development. I found a couple errors in here that you'll see with strike through underline. Um, but the utility connections, um, each unit shall be on a separate utility connection. It stated directly between each dwelling, which made it sound like you had to put the utility right between the two dwellings, which 
the intent was that it has to extend from each dwelling unit to the utility for water, sewer, or electrical utilities. So just having that connection to the road. Um, and then we're allowed to require dedication of any easements for uh, public services and access to the public right of way. The second standard for fire sprinklers, that should be removed. That was tied to the ADU law. And I apologize, I repeated that and threw it in this ordinance, but really uh, all these developments have to meet fire code. And so I don't wanna put a, an exception in there. Um, vacation rentals are prohibited. Separate sale of primary dwelling the units within a two unit development on the same parcel may not be sold or conveyed separately. Uh, the guaranteed allowance is listed here. Again, I had a reference to accessory dwelling units, so I'm gonna strike that when I bring it back. Um, converting and replacing existing structures. This is the non-conforming that we've talked about um, already. And then the land use is that it shall be unlawful to use uh, any dwelling unit under this chapter for any use other than residential. Any questions on the general requirements? Does that mean uh, home occupation uh, use is prohibited for offices and so forth? Under G? Yeah, you know, um, if we want to allow home off, we should probably state that. Here, Layla, would you agree? Yeah, yeah, and we would definitely want to make sure that still the primary use is the residential use, and then if someone is, you know, using an extra room or something like that for um, some type of home occupation, then we can probably specify that. But the the main point is that it has to be a residential use. Primarily. Well, I think that's that's in, uh, implied in our home occupation requirements. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I had a quick question. Um, this is Commissioner Christensen. I about um, utility connections and possibly even public works requirements with stormwater, like we were just talking about. I know that um, new connections and um, stormwater, especially, can be pretty cost prohibitive. Is there any subsidies through the state of California that they're allowing um, discounted uh, connection rates or water allowances or anything else? Um, are, does anybody know any information about that? <laughs> Not that we've heard of yet. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times uh, when these types of regulations come down from the state, it's usually the regulation first and then, mm -hmm. um, you know, helpful programs and things like that sort of trail. Um, mm -hmm. So hopefully that would be something that will come forward in the future. But right now, there, um, I have not. Uh, uh, seen anything like that. Okay, thank you. Okay. So any additional questions on two unit development? I have one. I'm not sure how you're going to answer this, but how do you create two 800 square foot units on a 1,280 square foot lot and meet our setback requirements. You, you can't. <laughs> you can't. So we would have to, um, if we had that scenario, um, somebody having a 1,200 square foot lot, which is the minimum allowed by state law, uh, we would have to allow them to go higher and to build out into the setbacks. They could not uh, comply with that, so the standards we have in place. But they could build two 400 square foot houses. They could, but they're allowed, they're uh, permitted to build up to 800. And so. Well, then they should have a bigger lot. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the state law setting that, that minimum square footage of the 800 square feet that um, kind of tends to supersede almost any objective standard that we put in, it's kind of intended to be read throughout all of the objective standards that, yes, these are the objective standards that apply, but if any of them happen to preclude the construction of two minimum 800 square foot units on either lot, then that particular um, requirement would not apply. 
that's sort of the trump card. <laughs> yeah, so within your example, um, if it was limited to one story, I mean, they would be able to develop from the front. There would be no setbacks, and they could go up because you can't get 1,600 square feet in a single story on a 1,200 square foot lot. So, good questions. Okay. Um, so I was going to run you through an example. If you want, we could open the public hearing now and then do an example, and then I'll have specific questions for the Planning Commission. Um, would you like to do that? Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Um, we can open it up to public comment. Um, uh, anybody in, from the public wishing to speak on this item, now is your chance to get in your uh, uh, your issues and uh, comments for our consideration. Any hands raised? Any emails? And I want to look to Sean. I do not see any hands raised at this time, and I do not have any new public comments written in. We should put this in the city newsletter that goes out every month. <laughs> Oh, I did just get a hand raised. Okay. Okay. Um, she, I, I was sent a, an email as well as a hand raised. So I think I'm going to unmute Paula Bradley and see if she'd like to explain her comments. Okay, Paula Bradley, you have the floor. You're muted. Thank you. I sent an email with several questions, so I was hoping I could get a, a response to the email if, if it was received. I sent it to public comment. Um, so, Katie, are we taking questions from the public or are we just making uh, uh, them available to comment? Um, typically, they have up to three minutes to comment. Um, we could, if you want to read your email or um, I don't see a copy of the email, so if you want to go okay. ahead and... Okay, let me, let me find that email here. Yeah, it's quite a bit of, quite a few questions, so... Um, well, you could, you could go ahead and, and read it, and I don't know that we'll necessarily answer all the questions, but it'll be food for thought, and we okay. can address them at our, you know, as we, as we feel appropriate. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, the first question is in the ordinance section 16.78.020 about eligibility in um, D3. I, I didn't understand that section and I was hoping someone could explain it. And also with that question, um, I was wondering where, where that requirement comes from. Is it from Senate Bill 9 or the if you could speak into the phone or the microphone, uh, oh, okay. well, it's very difficult to hear you. Putting my headset on. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. I put my headset on. Sorry about that. Um, so I was asking if someone could explain ordinance section 16.78.020 eligibility and, and under that D3, um, that's in the staff report page four or the packet page 34. And I was wondering where did that requirement come from? Is it from Senate Bill 9 or is it from the government code reference the Ellis Act? And then I, I can continue reading my questions. Yeah, yes, please continue. Okay, and I can send it also, try sending it again. We, we have it. Oh, you have it, okay. So if I understand correctly, it seems like with the requirements of D3 and D4 that an urban lot split is only intended to be allowed for an owner-occupied unit prior to the lot split. And then the next one, section D3 and D4, 
if I understand it correctly, only applies if there is a demo, but not if there's an existing unit not proposed to be demolished. And, and furthermore, so an existing unit could be either owner or tenant occupied and still be eligible. And then um, section eight further down, does, does that section mean that an owner in the city can only apply for a two lot split one time ever? That, that's what it sounds like to me. And then number six, only a new unit on a new second lot is restricted to the 800 foot maximum, but not an existing unit. And, and, and an existing unit then could be any size, whatever size it happens to be. Um, and then do the setbacks, if there's an existing unit and a new lot, would the existing unit have to meet the, the new development standards for setbacks? And, and then seven, I think I heard Katie say that one lot can be sold with a two lot uh, split, but if it's two separate lots, they can both be sold, right? And then um, I know she said, said something like if there's two new units on two new lots, they have to be sold together. I'm asking for clarity there. And that the last question, bear with me, is a, a two unit development is two detached units. And, and I'm just asking, is that right? So those were my questions, sorry, there's so many. So, uh, so, Katie, let me let me jump in here and 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 just say that uh, some of these questions seems to have already been answered. But let me ask you a question. I mean, uh, these can be uh, answered by a visit to the front desk for the most part, right? And the advantage of that of of Ms. Bradley bringing up these um, uh, questions to our attention would be to stimulate. Uh, Planning Commission's questions and concerns and things that maybe have not been addressed. I, I frankly would be interested in a review of D3 and 4. Um, maybe you could just go over those quickly. Um, I, I really don't know how to handle questions in, in the public comment section. This is maybe should we just digest way. these and ask if there are any more public comments? Mm -hmm. before we start answering questions. Yes, yeah, Sean, are there any more public comments or? There have been no other comments made. Okay. All right, well, well, I would I, think I we think would deserve it, some. It, uh, go ahead, Katie, you have the floor. I'd be happy to um, bring back a response to all of these questions in the next packet, if you'd like, or what? what these are, they're in-depth questions. I think it is actually a really good question that uh, number four about section D3 and D4 and whether or not that applies. A lot of our, we have in our, there are a lot of really good technical questions in here. Paula is a great local planner, so she knows her stuff and I'm glad to get these questions, but I, I would like to take the time to review them and get accurate answers. Um, one, like, Definitely, if you do a lot split, I just want to clarify that if there's two new lots, you can only sell the two new lots, each lot separately. They can each have two units on them. The two units on the separate lots cannot be sold individually. Or the two units on the same lot cannot be sold individually. I'd be happy to bring back this list with a response to the next um, planning commission. I'd be happy to meet with Paula beforehand, so sooner rather than later. I would like to hear the answers to three and four. <laughs> right. So, do we so why don't you go ahead and do that then, and 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 plan uh, a slide with these answers for for the next presentation, and then also meet with Paula if she so desires. Sounds good. Is that is that okay with the commission? Sounds good. All right. So if we have no more public comments then we can go back to planning commission deliberation um 
Katie wanted to ask some questions ahead more presentation. Yeah, I, I have some really pointed questions. I'm getting a good feel, I think, where the Planning Commission is headed, but um, I wanted to run through an example. I think Nick has already run through this example uh, verbally, but just quickly. Um, so an example of a 40 by 80 foot lot is seen here, a minimum of 20 foot frontage. This is our typical lot in Capitola, uh, divided straight down the middle. Um, well, we, that's not showing up right you now. You put your oh, uh, not? screen chair back up, please. Uh -oh. Okay, thank you. Screen chair. Hmm. Okay. Screen chair. You see that? Yeah, here we go. Okay. So here's our example of a 40 by 80 lot. It's subdivided into two lots. It meets the minimum frontage of 20 feet. We put in our setbacks, 15 foot front yard and then four feet around the other yard. What we're left with, as Nick stated, is 732 square feet. And we have a requirement by law to be able to build two, not just one, two 800 square foot units on each lot. So um, there, and here's that objective that guarantee that um, the objective development standards and objective design standards of this chapter shall not prohibit a two unit development with up to 800 square feet. So in this scenario, we would, the planning commission, it'd be good for our ordinance to identify where we wanna be flexible. So does height matter the most? Do setbacks matter the most? Um, do front yard setbacks matter the most? So in, in this example, to get those two units, they would be going up to three stories for sure and breaking the height limit. Um, so what we did um, is we looked at our typical lots by neighborhood and broke it down for like the jewel box. You typically have a 40 by 80 lot, 44 First Avenue, West Capitola, 40 by 100. Um, so we broke down the different neighborhoods um, as mentioned a lot, and then could they accommodate two 800 square foot single story? Is, is it feasible? Um, and what we found is you really need a, a minimum 4,000 square foot lot in order to comply uh, to within the standard. So a lot of our neighborhoods would not. The Jewel Box, Riverview Terrace, Depot Hill is a mix. Um, so my next question for you is now that we've concluded that the ordinance we drafted doesn't really work for most uh, lots under 4,000 square feet, where does the Planning Commission see room for us to be more flexible? Because I do think we need to develop some different standards. We can either uh, outline different standards for lots less than 4,000 square feet. So we could decrease the side yard setback to three feet in the front yard set back to 12 and then they'd have a build, bigger building pad. Um, is height less important and they could go higher? Uh, we already talked about the fact that as drafted, it really should say two stories. Um, uh, the side yard setback, the rear setback, should we decrease the open space? So that's, I'm looking for some feedback on this item. And if you'd like, I'm happy to bring this back if you want time to think about it and we list questions um, as a follow-up or if you want to work through them tonight. But I have a few slides like this. Could you run through your calculations two uh, screens back? I, I didn't understand them. Oh. So um, just take the jewel box one. I just need one so you can tell me how you calculate these things. Okay. So the jewel box, the typical lot is 40 by 80. Right. Um, once you take the four foot setbacks off, it becomes the building pad, which you can build on is 32 feet. And the length of the building pad, when you take 80 feet and you subtract the 19 feet for um, the front yard setback and the rear yard setback, is 61. Yeah. Um, so then when you multiply that together, the 32 by 61. Um, okay, I get that. And why can't you put two 800 square foot single story homes? 
the building pad is only oh. 732 square feet. <laughs> so, you know, what we didn't do here is we didn't do the subdivision. So then you would like divide it in half Eight. on your smaller lot. Um, so then you get 976, which you could still. Uh, it, and there's an extra like 221 for the, the additional, the new side yard that you've just created on each of the two lots. Unless so, they're attached. What? Unless they're attached. Well, um, but for the, uh, so sorry, I, I should have run through that table a little more thorough at the end, but uh, the 732, this is the correct number based on you, we would have created two more setbacks of the four okay. foot setback. So that's, those numbers were wrong, sorry. Um, but going through that exercise, for all of the lots that are 40 by 80, this, this would be, if they did an urban lot split, the 732. But, you know, Katie, actually, if we leave that 10-foot separation standard in there, it's even less. Correct, yeah. yeah. But it's just the footprint. You can go two stories. Why did you say three stories? Um, because if, if the, you're, you get up to you get two, so you can't meet the 800 on the first and second. You, you need to go into a third story. Um, Isn't it 732 feet of footprint? Yeah. Yeah, but you got you got to put two units in that 732 oh. square feet, so you need 1,600 square feet. Oh, you need two units. Yeah. Two units. You're allowed two units. So. So does the parking count in the 800 square feet? So we haven't specified in the parking if the parking needs to be covered or uncovered. Um, I was assuming uncovered that I do have slides on parking as well, but the parking. Before you leave that slide, what what happens to Commissioner Newman's suggestion if you just squish those two units together? What's what's the square footage of the gap between them? These are two separate lots, so you wouldn't squish these two together. Uh, you have uh, two units on each block on each blue building so pad. You can have attached. Uh, for lots and attached units. With yeah, right. it could be like uh, like roadhouses, yeah. right? Yeah, like townhouses. We we could if we design it that way. The way we have uh, drafted the ordinance, you could not have a structure over the property line into the neighboring property. So we'll we take it right up. Yeah. So what is that square footage, though? That's would we get our 800 feet if, if, if we were to say you can build right up to the property line? So in, in between the houses? We would, we would meet that. I think that's the way to go. Yeah. That's or we would also. Um, that's an easy fix. Yeah, and, and also if we went to three feet setback uh, for the side and rear, we would hit the 800. That makes it a little close to your neighbor. Yeah, better to have them attached. Okay, between the where their new property line is. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just gonna show you this really quick. So I, I went through that exercise, and I actually have a slide. So if you took the if you decreased your setback to from four feet to three, you'd have an 854 square foot pad, but if you were to allow it to have a zero foot setback in the middle, your building pad is a lot larger at 976. So. Yeah. I think it also makes sense maybe instead of doing it that way, you could also reduce the front yard setback slightly. Okay. I'm going to go back to this list. So it seems like the, um, the, the internal setback between the two lots could be decreased to zero. And then any more thoughts on the front yard setback that Commissioner Woods is suggesting? Yeah, I, would I prefer think that, that the, other than increasing the height or reducing the side yard, rear yard setbacks. Yeah, I agree Less with that. That's intrusive on the I, neighbor. I agree yeah. with Nick, I yeah. agree. Well, no, wait a minute. So if, if we did the, uh, if we if you, if you did the zero lot line between the two units, you've got your 960 square feet. You don't have to compromise on your front setback. Yeah, but if you chose not to do that. 
well, then you don't, it's not approved because you have to meet all these setbacks. Could we require that as a, one of the objective standards? They have to have a common wall? Well, no, only if, only if, it's, if it's a small enough lot. They can do whatever they can, want to, if the lot's big enough. But yeah. in the case of well, the I don't, box, I don't disagree with that. I'm, I'm not disputing that, but I'm not, I don't know that we can require a zero or lot line. That would be my question. And if we can't, then I'd prefer the front yard setback to be reduced rather than anything else. But I yeah. Agree. Commissioner Wilk, it's not that we're requiring it. We're saying, if, you know, here are the requirements and that's the way you can meet them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I would I would be reluctant to change the front yard setback because that's what sets the community is, you know, the the the, yeah. the amount of yards and everybody in you know the street the streetscape and the curb appeal and all that has to do. That's what the, the whole community enjoys. So a, a smaller front setback would I would think would have a bigger impact on the community as a whole as opposed to yeah. just your neighbor. I, yeah, I think the common wall makes more sense because then obviously you get into some design things and perhaps they would like to complement the two front structures if they have a common wall. I think it alleviates a lot of those kind of problems. But remember, there's going to be no front yard because you're going to have to have two driveways there to provide parking for these units. The lot's only 40 feet wide. 20 feet of it's going to go to do two 10 feet driveways. So yeah, they're going to be Hollywood style, yard so anyway. going to be they're going to be very grassy. <laughs> All the driveway is 10 feet wide. All the more reason not to uh, shorten the front yard setback. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, the cars are going to be poking on the sidewalk. Okay, so I'm, I'm hearing don't modify the front yard setback, modify the internal setback, um, keep the open space requirement of 48 square feet. That, yes. Yeah. Well, we've got a few, we've got some square footage to play with if we have a zero lot line, uh, <laughs> because it, that brings the total footprint up to 900 and some square feet. So we could reduce or increase the, the rear yard setback to give someone a, a little bigger rear yard. Layla, do you have a... Yeah, if I could just ask this clarifying question, because um, I'm not a planner, so, <laughs> so that I understand. Um, when we're talking about reducing the internal setback between the two properties to zero, um, I'm just thinking of the scenario where we would have uh, the lot split and then the construction of two units on each lot is um, is what the planning commission is saying would we would reduce the internal uh, setback to zero so the the two lots the two uh, units on either lot would be very close together but then if we're talking about four units would those also be um, connected or or I guess I'm just It'd be like a fourplex. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there was a time when zero lot line subdivisions were pretty popular. And so um, I think there's some pretty good examples out there of ones that have been done. We have some on Gray Street. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah. I mean, for. You know, I sort of go back and forth for this because, you know, I understand we have to abide by the state law. I understand there's a need for providing additional housing. And, um, you know, I think our ADU ordinance could work pretty well. This one gets so complicated because they're for sale units. And, you know, that, that makes it a little more complicated, but I mean, they're, they're definitely going to have an impact on the neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would like to make a suggestion and, and just incorporate the zero lot line and increase the, the rear yard setback um, to make the footprint 800 square feet. 
So one concern I have about that is, is good design usually isn't just a box. You usually like to have a little articulation in the um, in the structure. So if we were to limit it to 800 square feet, we would, you know, they'd be able to produce it, but it's going to be a box. And to really keep the tradition and the flow of our neighborhoods, I think we want more, more articulation. Yeah. Good point. Um, add maybe a helpful fact um, is that the parking requirement um, where I'm sorry state law allows for the city to um, and requires access to either unit and either uh, lot that's created by the lot split um, however it state law does not mandate that that has to be in the form of a driveway or a separate driveway for both lots so there is a contemplation there if the planning commission wanted to consider it to potentially also uh, have a shared driveway, but then, you know, still requiring the uh, off-site off parking, or sorry, on-site parking for each unit. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. I think that creates, again, some more complications for for sale units and the fact that we don't want tandem parking going on in that driveway. Of course. But, you know, at this point, I, I think we've given Katie some pretty good ideas to look at. Yeah. And I, I don't, for me personally, I haven't hard and fast excluded you know, any new changes that she wants to propose, I'm just trying to give some direction. Okay, um, and I do have some slides on parking. Uh, so the maximum unit size, we have it at 800 square feet in the R1, it's the floor area ratio. I think uh, Commissioner Christensen had a Oh, sorry, go ahead. It's okay. No, I, I could cover that when you talk about parking. Go, okay, okay. <laughs> Um, so maximum unit size 800 square feet. I'm just looking for a nod of heads if you'd like us to keep the max at 800 square feet. I know Los Gatos is allowing 1,200 square feet. I think Oakland's allowing a lot more square feet. So um, how do you feel about 800 square feet? So that's the minimum and the maximum then? It's the, yeah, the well, maximum of our code and the minimum by right by the state law. I don't think we can accommodate anything larger on the side of our lot. But what, what, I, what about, if they could? <laughs> what about lots in Cliffwood Heights, for example? I think it's gonna be, can, can we have different standards for different size lots? Yes. You know, so it's, it's uh, like Commissioner Newman said, I mean, there's a huge difference in a 9,000 square foot lot in Cliffwood Heights and in a you know 4,000 square foot lot in Riverview Terrace or the jewel box. So maybe for we need to have two sets of standards, one for lots up to a certain size and one beyond that size. I know it makes it more complicated, but it would be more realistic for the city. So if we're gonna cram everybody into the jewel box, let's cram everybody into the Cliffwood Heights too. Let's make everybody <laughs> suffer. Well, Susan, I don't think we we really need to do that. If we just have a larger maximum like Los Gatos, it will only apply in the larger lots because yeah. we're having enough time trouble fi fitting the 800 square foot units in the jewel box. That's true because it's not a guarantee. When If we were to have 1,200 listed, the guarantee is only up to the 800 square feet. Yeah. Okay, that makes good sense, Commissioner Newman. Yeah, great point. Um, well, then the question is, what is that number and why? Well, I, isn't it um, within the ADU that you can you can have a minimum? I think for a single bedroom or a studio, it's eight fifty, and then for if you provide a two bedroom, the minimum or the maximum is thousand. Isn't that correct? Is that right? Twelve hundred. Twelve hundred. Um, could that apply in this circumstance saying if you had, you know, the, the maximum square foot, square feet for a, a single occupant, you know, a single occupant for a, um, 
the unit would be 800 and the maximum would be 12. I mean, if the, the lot would allow that. I think that really muddies the water. Yeah. I, I could go with Commissioner Newman's uh, proposal that if we have it at 1,200 square feet, you're not guaranteed to get that. That just says that's the maximum it can be. What you're guaranteed under state law is the 800 square feet. So if you can't fit it on and meet the setback requirements, you don't get more than 800 square feet. I mean, that, that seems pretty clear to me and would work. And um, to Commissioner Christensen's point, do you want that tied to bedrooms as it no. is our ADU no. ordinance, the requirement for two bedrooms? No, I don't care how many bedrooms they have. Or they want one big room. Okay. That's up to them. I'm with Commissioner Westman. So is the, so is, is the, the, the notion here is that we, we should have the square footage for our maximum ADUs be consistent with our square footage for the two unit development. So that, so that won't be a driver as to which way they go. <laughs> uh, for me, they're, that's, they're really not connected. I just think it's a good suggestion to have the 1200 square feet as commissioner Newman said, cause it gives a little more flexibility for people who do happen to have a larger lot. So are you going to define a minimum lot size for that? Well, what we define is they'd have to meet all the setback requirements that we're going to impose. They, they also, the minimum lot size is 40% of the existing lot. That's set up by the state law. So this, so what safeguards are there that someone can't build a 1,200 square foot on a 40 by 80 lot? Yeah, no, they won't be able to, but we better make Why? this ordinance so it's easily it's amended it. because this this is a work in progress. I mean, we could go on all night on this. <laughs> so I, I was thinking I'll take your comments from this evening and I'll come back with an updated draft and we'll work through it. Um, but I'm hearing to consider 1,200 square feet and knowing yeah. that the guaranteed allowance is only up for, to the 800 square feet. Are you going to define that 1,200 square feet in certain size lots? No, to, because it will only... To, are you going to exempt 40 by 80 lots from that 1,200 square feet? No, the 40 by 80 will be forced into the 800 square foot. Um, I see what you're saying. Because we're making some, we're we're decreasing the standards for lots under 4,000 square feet to be able to accommodate the 800 square foot development. So possibly the best route is to only allow units greater than 800 square feet on lots that are greater than 400 square feet because we're creating decreased setbacks. And yeah, you'll have to look at it and study it and come up with a suggestion. A suggestion. Okay. More sleepless nights. <laughs> yep. You know, but before we leave this, uh, you know, I've been sending all of you some some information from this organization that started to the chagrin of the city attorney. But you know, it's there's there's a movement afoot to repeal SB nine, <laughs> and it's it's being led by the mayor of Redondo Beach, uh, Bill Brand and Jovita Mendoza, a council member in uh, Brentwood, California. You know, it's been supported by the Southern California Association of Governments. And uh, a recent poll on January 28th showed 71% disapprove of SB9. And the organization is called Our Neighborhoods, or what is it, Our, Our Neighborhood Voices. And it's a coalition of a lot of different city governments and, and uh, neighborhood leaders. You can Google it for information, but I would advise everyone, people listening, all of, all of you on the commission to take a look at this because they're attempting to get enough signatures to put this on the ballot in November to repeal SB9. 
And I think it stands a good chance of being repealed at that time. If hopefully they'll get enough signatures. And just one other thing, the city of Woodside, I don't know if you saw this, yes. declared, them, declared themselves a wildlife sanctuary so they don't have to follow the SB9 regulation. Woodside. <laughs> I think we should secede from the union. State <laughs> Jefferson. At least from California. <laughs> Okay. All right, can we get back to the uh, topic at hand? <laughs> um, okay, next I wanted to discuss height and flexibility within height. Um, I think one of the one of our guiding principles as we're looking at this ordinance is that we really want to make sure that the new units fit within our single family development. I had taken the ADU allowances for height of 16 feet for the first story and 22 feet for the second story. The R1 standard is 25 feet. If the Planning Commission would like, we could uh, make that those numbers consistent with the R1 and have it at 25 feet. So anything that's built doesn't look a little bit shorter than the single family homes that are around. I think the difficulty is they're not going to have the same setbacks that a single family house has to conform to. You know, it, 25 feet is fine if you have, you know, a 15 foot rear yard. 25 feet has a huge impact if you have a four foot rear yard. So for and right it's also, now. Yeah, it's also a solid wall, Susan, because there is no additional setback for the second story. That's right. So for me, I would, I'd leave it the way it is tonight. Okay, and Commissioner Christensen? Um, the only thing that I would, that would comment on is that these seem pretty consistent with the ADU ordinance. So, I mean, regardless of whether it's 22 or 25, it's, you're still gonna have a structure that's closer to the rear and side property lines in, you know, in any given rear yard. So it doesn't, I don't, I don't see too much difference in my opinion. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the next move forward with how it's drafted in terms of height, but we will add, we'll take out that maximum one story as discussed previously. Yeah. Um, setbacks, we discussed. Thank you, we'll move on. Um, open space, we discussed. There was direction to keep the 48 square feet. Okay, parking. This is, I think, the last big discussion for us on this. Um, so the parking requirements is that there's one required space per unit and there's exceptions for transit or car share. Tandem space for a separate residential unit is not allowed. Parking design, required off street parking may be located within a minimum required setback area from front, side and rear property lines. I believe that's out of the state code, the state law. Um, this, the second standard is from our ADU ordinance, Hollywood design with two parallel strips of pavement is allowed um, if, if, if you do a, um, if you do parking in the front yard. Also parking is accessed from an alley, shall maintain a 24 foot back out area, which may include the alley, that's from our ADU standards. So thinking about parking, this, um, some real big concerns came up um, within the urban lot we also have requirements that lots without 20 feet or more of frontage on a street will not be permitted, except that frontage requirements for flag lots may be satisfied by a driveway or private road accessing a street with a minimum of 10 feet in width or a maximum of 40% of the lot width or 20 feet, whichever is less. That's our typical driveway standard. So I tried to put what parking would work with this example that we showed previously. And you're starting to see not only is parking an impact, but we're gonna lose a lot of street parking because of all the new curb cuts that would occur from this mm -hmm. ordinance. So um, we have the ability to direct that. Um, we have the ability instead of saying a minimum um, driveway width of 10 feet, we can say that's the maximum. Um, we can also, state that there can only be one curb cut per um, development so that um, there'd be shared access points onto these, with these lots. We were allowed to have um, agreements put in place for, we could have access agreements 
So the thought being here is if we were to allow a subdivision that we still, we could create standards so that there's still only one curb cut so we maintain the street parking. Because as we lose that street parking, not only do we have a minimum requirement on the site, but also we won't have, we won't be able to make up for it in the street. So I wanted to see if there was support for, um, should we add standards to minimize curb cuts? We'll think through it. This is really rough right now and it hasn't been assessed at all, but if you'd like us to look into it, we can look into minimizing curb cuts. And also, should we create maximum driveway width tied to these really tight subdivisions rather than minimum? I agree with limiting the curb cuts and having a maximum width on the driveway. Yeah, I would agree with that. <clears throat> I'd also suggest on the on the 40 by 80 lots that mm -hmm. the driveways be required to be on the outside property lines of each lot to leave the center area open for landscaping. Uh, I, well, yeah. I, so for clarification, Commissioner Roof, you're saying to push the building to the outside interior lot line and to use no, the center? No, no, okay. no, I'm saying push the driveway to the outside lot line uh -huh. on each side. I see. Sorry. That, so would keep, that, that, that might would be challenging 20, in this scenario. That would keep 20 feet of open space in the front of the houses. You know they're going to park in front of the, one of the parking spaces is going to be in front of the houses. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the big, uh, huge problems with this whole ordinance that we have you know, ability not to comply with is going to be the impact on parking in our neighborhoods big time as this uh, starts to evolve and anything we can do to lessen what's going to be a tremendous uh, to mitigate what's going to be a tremendous negative impact some of our neighborhoods already have uh, parking problems and this is not going to help uh, um at all. Can't you agree with the minimum curb cut? Minimum curb cuts and uh, and I know we just want objective standards so we can't put something in along the lines that the uh, driveways have to be designed so as to minimize impact on uh, off street parking but maybe we can come up with some objective standards that uh, end in that direction. Okay. I had a question, Katie, for, um, for staff. Mm -hmm. With um, with these ordinances, I didn't really hear anything about um, placing parking possibly underneath the structures, or it's like given an option to in your slide here, um, the one on the right hand side. If you came down the center of a shared driveway, say, and the parking was located, if the height was increased and the the structure was built on the second story and there was parking available underneath. Um, would that be something that would be allowed or encouraged or how do you feel about that? Um, do, do you mean like digging down like or, can, or covered um, within the first story? Within the first story. Okay. Yeah, I think if it can be accommodated in the square footage, I, I also mm -hmm. think we can guide the parking. We can say that uh, Parking shall, should be in the behind the homes if we want. You know, we can build in some standards like that. For I'll 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 look at um, what's out there and bring back examples of how we can kind of direct parking to meet the objective of uh, minimizing the impact to the street as well as preserving our front yard. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just looking around in the village, I see a lot of development that's shoved into very small spaces. <laughs> And it just seems that a lot of them, I mean, that are creatively designed can, you know, tuck parking in, you know, you go through a driveway and you hook around and can park inside of a, you know, covered area that's within the primary structure or, you know, under the primary structure. And it just, it seemed to work well for, you know, small spaces. Mm -hmm. so just... 
Yeah, that might work in Cliffwood Heights. It certainly won't work in the rest of the community. But again, my suggestion is if you push the, the driveways to the outside of each lot, you have a 20 foot space in between, you can still maintain an on-street parking spot for a small vehicle, a compact vehicle, and you've also allowed 20 feet in between the two driveways to accommodate some landscaping. So that would be my suggestion. And it may also depend, commissioners, on the location and orientation of any existing residents or existing structures. Um, that might be something to also just kind of keep in mind. And one of my main goals would be to create parking that's going to be used for parking. Um, I have become to be not a big fan of garages because particularly in the neighborhood I live in where people have small homes, very few people use their garage to park a car in. So in, in this case, I would like to see the parking, you know, it could be covered, but not as a garage. I would tend to agree with that as well. Other comments? Mr. Christensen? Um, no further comments. Okay. Thank you. I'll bring back some standards. Then here I just list the objective design standards. I just want to see if there's, I think you've already provided me feedback on this. So there's no more comments needed there. And that is the end of my presentation and questions for you. So I really appreciate uh, your attention to detail tonight and getting through this. And I hope to bring back something. Uh, Layla and I will be working on this and bringing back a, the next round. Any any so, comments on the overall process or questions? I have uh, a question. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Commissioner Westman. Uh, so uh, I, I have a question a little bit about process. I agree with Commissioner Newman that, you know, this is something that we want to get done because um, I think we can build in some safeguards that will help our neighborhood. Uh, I also feel like I don't want to see staff caught in this back and forth with the Coastal Commission, which I know can be extremely time consuming. So um, uh, I, I would like you to give us some update on, on where they are with their requirements because I really don't want to submit something to them until we have a pretty good, clear understanding about what they are going to require to get an LCP amendment adopted. So I think we sort of have a two-track thing going. We, we need to do our work. Uh, as a city, but we also need to know what the Coastal Commission is doing. So in the end, we can link those two together to have a successful submission to them. So I hope you'll keep us updated on their thoughts as we go through this. I will. You know, usually I try to share um, an ordinance well in advance with the Coastal Commission, which we did with our outdoor dining. And yeah, I, I, um, we are in discussions now and hopefully they'll be able to give me more direction. They were very vague during our meeting of exactly what they, they expect to see. Are you gonna give a presentation to the city council? Not yet, I'd like to work through with our planning experts, the planning commission first, and <laughs> then they, they know we're working on this, but I really wanna fine tune it with you all first and then we'll bring it to planning to city council when it's ready. I had one last question. Is outside of the coastal zone, just for clarification, I'm sorry if I make you repeat yourself, but um, this is enacted now so people can actually do this now if they're outside the coastal zone? Correct. Okay. But inside the coastal zone, there's a little, it's muddy or it's basically they they can't? They cannot do it now. They can't bring us. My, my, so I think there's disconnect as Layla pointed out earlier between what the state law says and 
the interpretation by the Coastal Commission. So from what I've heard of the, from the Coastal Commission is that we can we shouldn't be reviewing any SB9 applications within the coastal zone until we have our ordinance certified by the Coastal Commission. I see. Okay. And we know how fast that happens. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Thank any you, other sir. questions on <laughs> item 6B before we move to the director's report? <laughs> Let us then move to the director's report. Katie, do you have anything else? I um, I do not. I'm going to be publishing the RFP for our housing element update, which is another fun project ahead of us. So that's it. No, no other information for you tonight. And then you're going to maybe have something on balconies uh, next meeting? We're hoping for the next meeting. We're putting together, we're doing some research and looking into, um, we'd like to, we're gonna bring forth about five different examples of, of from different cities and what their objective standards are. We'll also go over the floor area ratio and how we remove the second story decks from the floor area ratio. And we're not gonna come, for, come forward with an ordinance for you. We just wanna get kind of less than we had tonight, just uh, direction or work session item to see whether or not you want us to move forward with an amendment. Thank you. So. Uh, commissioners com communications. Uh, any commissioners wish to uh, make a final statement? Mayor Wilk, if I could just uh, suggest that uh, we uh, take an action on uh, the SB9 item. Um, I think he had mentioned potentially continuing the item um, and then we could, we could keep public comment open or we could close public comment um, at, the, at the commission's discretion. Well, I didn't think we had an action on 6B. Uh, it was just a presentation. So oh. we need to authorize a second presentation? No, there is action um, within the recommendation. Sorry, I don't have a slide for the recommendation. Um, can I make a motion to continue this item to our March 7th meeting? And I think it's appropriate to continue to leave the public hearing open because this is going to impact our community and we would like to hear from them. I would second. Correct. Um, point of clarification, I think it's March 3rd. Okay, March 3rd, sorry. Okay, I have a, uh, a motion by Commissioner Weston and a second by Commissioner Ruth. Wait, uh, Louis, we have a roll call for continuance. Hi. 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 All right. Okay, now we'll move to commission uh, communications. Do any commissioners have um, final words? Uh, Happy Courtney, your hand is raised. <laughs> oh, no, my hand's been raised for a while. It's gone, so sorry. <laughs> All right. Anyone else? I, okay. With that, then, uh, this meeting is adjourned. Good night, Thank everyone. Good night. Good job, Thank Katie. You. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>